John Friedman is professor of economics and international and public affairs at Brown University and a founding director of Opportunity Insights at Harvard University. His research brings together theory and data, harnessing the power of large administrative data sets to yield policy relevant insights on a wide range of topics, including taxation, healthcare, and education quality. His work has appeared in top academic journals as well as in major media outlets. He, his most well-known papers estimate the long-term effects of teachers on student outcomes, such as college attendance and earnings. In just one year, a great teacher can raise the lifetime earnings of a single class of students by nearly $1.5 million. This work was cited by President Obama in his 2012 State of the Union Address. Friedman has also worked as a special assistant to the president for economic policy at the National Economic Council in the White House from 2013 to 2014. He holds a PhD in economics, an AM in statistics, and a BA in economics, all from Harvard University. He is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and the editor in chief of the Journal of Public Economics. I am pleased to present to you at this time, Dr. John Friedman. Great, well, thank you so much uh, for this uh, opportunity to talk to you uh, about what COVID-19 has done to the economy. Uh, what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes is walk you through not only what we're seeing in the data, but show you how to look at the data yourself using a web platform that we've set up. Um, because I think this pandemic is not just an enormous recession. It's presenting a bunch of very unique challenges to uh, businesses, especially small businesses across the country, but in ways that differ uh, really markedly from, from place to place, as, as I'm going to show you. So the core to what I'm going to show you here today is data that we've collected through partnering with a range of private companies, many uh, uh, financial transactions companies like uh, in um, uh, Earnin or um, Wompley or Affinity Solutions, uh, also some payroll companies like Intuit and Paychex, you know, some of these companies you may have heard of, uh, some of them uh, you may not have heard of, but what makes them special, all of them, is that they provide a window into what's happening in our economy that's much more up-to-date and granular than anything we've seen before in national statistics. Typically, we get an unemployment rate right every month. Maybe we get it at the state level, but it's hard to get a sense of how things are going in Shelby County, how does that maybe differ from what's going on uh, in the rest of the state or in the rest of the country? Uh, we didn't get a sense for overall spending and GDP for what was happening in the core of the pandemic until July, uh, right? And we need to know what's happening in April and April, not four months later. And so based on all of this, what we've done is put together what we call the economic tracker uh, which I'm going to uh, show you here. Uh, this is a freely available website. You can go to it right now. It's called trackTheRecovery.org. And for instance, what I'm showing you is just the changes in consumer spending. Let's just start nationally here over the past nine months or so. And what you see, of course, is that things are going along swimmingly until we hit the pandemic. And then within two weeks, spending just absolutely craters. It falls by about 30%. This is the largest economic shock that uh, we've really seen ever, uh, not just in its size, but in its speed. And then uh, starting with the stimulus payments in the middle of April, things have uh, slowly started to recover. Um, and you can see how we've uh, trended up over the summer so that right now, uh, nationally, we estimate that we're about 4% down on spending. But of course, because this is a pandemic, that recovery in spending has been very uneven. 
So one way it's been uneven, of course, is that people really don't want to go out and uh, interact in person. And so, for instance, uh, if we click here, uh, we can subset this spending by industry. If we click on restaurants and hotels, that's now in the green line. There was a much steeper fall that fell by about two thirds in April. And it too has recovered, but still even uh, in our latest data from about two weeks ago, uh, it's 30% down on the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at spending on grocery items, uh, here there was that big spike right at the end of March as everyone was stocking up on you know, canned goods and, and toilet paper. But even after that, you see that uh, grocery spending has continued running at a level that's about 10% higher than uh, we saw in a, in a pre-pandemic world. Uh, another thing we've seen is big shifts from local businesses to online businesses. Um, and that's a shift which has uh, dramatically hurt small businesses across the country. So one of the things you can do on this tracker is look not just at what's happening uh, for spending, but here we can look at small business revenues as they've trended uh, over the same period. And here you see there was that uh, big fall it was actually 50% for small business revenues. And then it too has recovered, but it hasn't recovered nearly as far as spending has recovered. Because here you see small business revenues are down uh, 23% relative to the pre-pandemic levels. And what's worse, I think, you saw this very sharp recovery uh, for the first few months of the pandemic as uh, businesses started to reopen, they started to adjust to life in the pandemic. But then the recovery has really stalled, especially for small businesses, uh, so that we've not really seen any gain over the past four months. And that just highlights the fact that while the economy kind of is working again, uh, we're not in that trough that we saw right after the pandemic hit. Because the pandemic is still with us, it's not something that's led to broad-based recovery. And still, small businesses across America are hurting. Now, this is for the entire US. What about in Memphis? So uh, we can zoom in there and look at what's happening in Memphis specifically. And you see here that the, the patterns in Memphis have been pretty similar for small business revenue. Uh, there was a, a stronger recovery in early July um, and June, but then when this kind of second wave of the pandemic hit, spending fell back down. And then again, there was a little bit of a surge, but then spending fell back down again as, as cases rose. And so you see here, this is now looking specifically at uh, businesses uh, in, in Shelby County. Uh, and you see that small business revenues, uh, uh, again, are, are down by about, uh, 20%. And you can kind of explore a lot of the other things uh, on this website to get a sense, not just today, but a week from now, a month from now, how things are going. Let me switch back to my slides, though, and try to give you uh, a little bit of a sense, um, rather than just looking at the data, uh, a sense of why uh, what's happening is happening, and what we can do about it, both in the long term and then also uh, right now. So at its core, I showed you that this recession is driven by uh, the fact that no one wants to go out and consume in-person services anymore. And so what we've seen is that that pullback has been especially strong for higher income consumers. So for instance, this just shows consumer spending by day in this country. First, for high-income consumers, you saw that, see here, spending dropped by about $3 billion a day. And that's about 40% for high-income consumers in late March. And while it's recovered a little bit, it's still quite uh, far below the pre-pandemic levels. We're still missing about $750 million a day annually. And you contrast that with what's happened for uh, lower-income households, there, there was a, a smaller hit initially and spending recovered almost immediately. Uh, there are a number of reasons why we think this happened. 
um, you know, for instance, higher income households may have been more able to uh, stay at home, uh, less in need of going out to work uh, or uh, in, in going out in order to, uh, to, to replenish supplies because they can't you know, buy three months of groceries at once. And so this is uh, largely as a recession being driven by the pullback in spending for these higher income households. What's the consequence of that though? It's in-person services, which are often consumed very locally. And so what that means is that the businesses that are suffering uh, are often determined very locally by the nature of consumers that that business serves. And you can, in practice, what we, we found is that you can have two businesses, literally even two branches of the same chain might be in two different places uh, and having very, very different economic effects. And so just to give you uh, an example of how that works, I'm now showing you a map of New York City plotting by zip code changes in small business revenues in April. So this is kind of at the peak of the pandemic where are businesses suffering more than others? And the zip codes are colored so that red means that you're really hurting and the green or blue means that, you know, things are still uh, in a recession, but uh, it's not nearly as bad. And so for instance, in New York here, what you see is that these zip codes, these neighborhoods, businesses in Manhattan, especially in Midtown Manhattan and Lower Manhattan, where a lot of people aren't coming to work anymore, there's been a really strong reduction in revenue, right? More than two thirds drop in revenue for these businesses. But uh, businesses say up in the Bronx, which is right, less of the economic downtown, they're, they're still suffering hits, but uh, the reductions in revenue are much, much smaller. And as we have seen these, uh, this is in April where it was starkest, the recovery has preserved uh, many of these uh, geographic differences. Here's the same map now uh, looking at Memphis. And so you see a very similar pattern here where uh, kind of right in the center of town is where you see the largest reductions in small business revenue. When you get away from the center of town, again, not that there's no recession, but that um, business revenues have, have held up uh, much uh, more strongly. Now, Comparing over time here, we can also look at how Shelby County compares with Tennessee. And here you see that Shelby County is pretty similar uh, to the rest of Tennessee in terms of how small business revenues have, have evolved. Uh, you do see in general kind of a rural urban pattern um, across the country where in uh, you know, cities like Memphis, uh, Nashville, Little Rock, you've seen um, stronger falls in business revenue than um, in more rural areas. Now that stands in contrast to consumer spending where consumer spending in Shelby County has actually uh, maintained itself at a higher level than uh, across the rest of Tennessee. Uh, across the rest of Tennessee, um, consumer spending uh, still looks like it's down about 10%. That's on the high side nationally. In uh, Shelby County, uh, you see that spending uh, seems to be, I mean, it bounces around from, from week to week in our data, but it seems to be more or less on average uh, back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, but again, people are spending not on what they used to. And so that's what's driving this fact that even though people are spending, they may be buying things on Amazon as opposed to shopping locally at small businesses. That's what drives this divide. So here's what's happening on the business side. Uh, of course, uh, you know, it's not going to stop there. The effects of the pandemic are then going to flow through to the employees of those businesses. And so now let me move on to employment. And what we see nationally is uh, really uh, what people call a K-shaped recovery, right? For higher income workers here in, in uh, green, you see there was a quite sharp recovery, sorry, quite sharp recession, and then a quite sharp recovery. So that uh, essentially the recession was over for higher income workers uh, by the time we got to the beginning of summer. But for lower income workers down here in purple, you see it was a much sharper recession and while there was strong recovery for the first few months, we've uh, kind of flattened out here uh, and we flattened out at a level that's still missing millions of jobs nationally, 20% below the pre-pandemic peak. 
Um, and if anything, it's actually getting worse these days as businesses across the country are less able to adapt in the warm weather to put things outside. Uh, and of course that's happening at different rates in different places across the country. But this is something I think that is uh, really only going to get uh, worse. Now, uh, here's uh, th this very localized effect of business revenues has flowed through to a localized effect of unemployment as well. And so what we've seen in the data, here's uh, the same map of New York City looking at employment rates by neighborhood. Literally two workers who are working in the same restaurant chain. Uh, if it's the restaurant chain in Midtown Manhattan, uh, they've lost their job uh, by and large, where if it's a restaurant chain in some of the outer boroughs, they're much, much more likely to still be working. And this is very different from really any recession that we've had in, in the living memory, because in past recessions, it's not been uh, in-person services that people have cut back on. It's been more uh, kind of big ticket items like cars. And so if people aren't buying cars, uh, no matter where they are, that's gonna flow to the centers of car manufacturing in this country. Uh, you know, Some in Tennessee and in, in Michigan or other places across the South. Uh, but here, uh, it's a much more localized effect, right? Where if people cut back on spending in Memphis, it's going to really impact small businesses in Memphis. It's, it's that extremely localized um, pass through in a way that's going to mean that the impact of the recession, the severity is going to differ depending on exactly where you are in the country and is really going to require localized, uh, you know, a tailoring of, of policies. So, uh, let me just in the interest of time kind of talk about what can policy do? Well, we've looked at a bunch of policies and uh, the, the bad news is that many of the policies we've put in place haven't uh, really done that much to combat the recession. And at root, this is because this is a public health crisis. And until you fix that public health crisis, people still aren't gonna be willing to go back and eat at restaurants. Kind of there's no amount of money you can give people that's gonna help get those restaurants uh, back going. <clears throat> so just to show you a few examples, we've looked at state ordered reopenings. Uh, so for instance, <clears throat> you know, this is pretty simple. You can compare states like New Mexico and Colorado. They had a pretty similar uh, pandemic uh, experience in uh, April, but Colorado opened a few weeks earlier than New Mexico. And there was just no effect on economic activity. Why? Because it wasn't the lockdown that was keeping people from businesses. It was the fear of the pandemic. And it all just revolves around fixing the underlying public health crisis. Similarly, we can look at the uh, stimulus payments. Now, these payments did a great job supporting households and making sure they could put food on their table. The fact that we've had record levels of unemployment, especially for many lower income households, uh, we've actually, uh, you know, by and large, I held off the incredible suffering that would normally come from that due to these stimulus payments. You know, not saying that it couldn't be better, but it could have been much, much worse. What's the problem though? The problem is that these stimulus payments have increased spending in areas that were not really affected by the, the pandemic. So for instance, you know, here's just showing uh, the effect of stimulus payments literally on the day when these payments went out you see increases of 25, 30% in spending, literally overnight. However, what did people spend the money on? They spent the money on durable goods. They like bought new things to be in their house. The sectors that were really suffering are the in-person service sectors. And there was really no change in spending for these in-person service sectors when this money went out. And so, uh, I think what we learn here is that this type of st uh, stimulus, it's helpful for supporting households, but it's not really helpful for getting the economy back going again. The final policy we looked at were uh, these loans to small businesses through the PPP and other programs. And again, we can just do something really simple. We can look at how employment evolved at businesses that were just a little bit too big versus a little bit uh, uh, smaller and were eligible for the program. So here you see the eligible businesses are in green. The ineligible businesses, because they're a little bit larger, are in orange. And employment uh, fell really sharply across both of these types of businesses. There is a small, small additional recovery that we've measured 
um, for those businesses that were eligible for the PPP. Uh, it's about 2% effect on uh, unemployment. Now that's put millions of people back to work, uh, but you have to remember that we spent about half a trillion dollars on this program. And so the cost per job saved of the PPP turns out to be uh, nearly $400,000. We're paying $400,000 for every job saved. Now you ask, how can we be paying that much? It's because much of the, the aid that flowed from the PPP went to businesses that were not in fact suffering from the pandemic. They were largely uh, kind of white collar firms that had business that could be conducted over Zoom or remotely. And so we ended up uh, you know, subsidizing a bunch of businesses um, by and large uh, that were not really suffering. So this was kind of a pretty poorly targeted uh, piece of aid, even though it was you know, critical for some of those affected businesses uh, that got it. So let me just wrap up here and kind of take uh, sorry, some time for questions. I think there are really three takeaways from what we're seeing uh, nationally. The first is that the public health situation limits the effects of traditional stimulus, right? And kind of in the words uh, um, modified of Bill Clinton, right? It's the pandemic, stupid. Uh, until we get the public health situation under control, the economy and especially the in-person service sector is, is not coming back. Second, until the vaccine arrives, and you know, I was glad to see uh, good news on this uh, yesterday, I think the focus of policy has to be limiting the hardship among households and business owners. Right? We need to make sure that uh, households still have money to put food on their table and business owners who have a business that you know, was a perfectly good business six months ago and is gonna be a perfectly good business, you know, say six months from now when we get the vaccine out, we need to make sure that those businesses survive and that those households that own the businesses that they too are able to put food on their table. And third, I think that we've seen an unprecedented expansion of new small businesses uh, the small business creation numbers are at record levels in this country. Um, and that's something that's very unique in the US. We haven't seen that in many other countries. Uh, now that's something that's in part because uh, the economic response has largely focused on supporting households and businesses rather than locking employment in place. And so this has freed up people to be flexible and to adjust. It's allowed people to create new businesses and it's allowed uh, existing businesses to adjust. And so I think this is another way uh, in which, uh, you know, this is a role in which kind of the dynamism of the American economy is, is coming through, um, not just in the crisis, but even after the crisis, we're gonna need to adjust to the new way in which business is done. And the faster we can support the transitions to that new way of doing business, uh, the better off we're going to be. I just want to close by, you know, talking about the broader effects of this pandemic. You know, this is not only affecting uh, people and their jobs and their businesses today, but this is going to be with us for a long time. Uh, our children who have been out of school in many cases for, for, um, for nearly uh, uh, nine months now uh, are suffering learning losses that um, are going to be very difficult to make up. And what's, I think, especially sad here is that um, the learning losses are um, particularly large for children from low-income families, from uh, non-white families, in a way that this pandemic is really widening uh, what are already quite worrying existing inequalities in this country. And so I think that, you know, just trying to, you know, get people through it needs to be the focus uh, for the moment. But I, I really think that this needs to heighten our awareness of all of these inequalities to make sure that uh, when we come back, we come back in a way that uh, builds not just growth, but equitable growth and, and make sure that um, it really is a rising tide that lifts all boats. So let me stop there. And I'd love to uh, take your questions with uh, whatever time uh, remains. Uh, Joselle, um, uh, I, you can uh, just tell me whenever we uh, run out of time or, or what questions people are asking. So I don't see any questions in the, uh, in the chat or the question and answer uh, session at the moment, um, but are, are there any questions that, um, that I can answer about uh, the, the pandemic or about these, uh, these data or this website? Check in the chat. All right, thank you, John. Uh, we've been checking the chat. I don't see any questions uh, in the chat for you. Uh, I would urge attendees that if they do have a question, uh, to please take advantage of this opportunity while you while we have you here uh, to answer questions that you might have that they might have. And I'll, I'll just tell people, you know, this is something which is uh, evolving rapidly. 
Uh, it's something that uh, may change if there's a new stimulus package passed. And so I really encourage people to check out that website that I showed you. It's again, www.tracktherecovery.org. Um, uh, it's uh, in the slides that were circulated as well. And I think it's a great place to see the latest economic information, not just nationally, but uh, about what's going on uh, right here in Memphis. Well, we are very happy that you were able to share this information with us today, and especially to be able to look at the tracker and share with us information specifically about Memphis and Shelby County. Uh, we know here in our community, uh, because of the major industries that we have here and the impact that tourism and entertainment have on our region, that this information was very timely. Also is very important as we really think about policies that have been put in place, public policies, and we look at uh, the stimulus package, we look at the PPP loans, uh, we look at things that are being put in place now to educate our children um, and to ensure that they say, stay safe. So this was very timely. And one of the things that we know is very important, not only in Memphis, but across the nation, and that is until we get the public health crisis under control by creating safe places and spaces, it's going to be difficult for us to fully recover. So John, again, I thank you for your time today. We appreciate you being here with us, uh, sharing this information, providing this very valuable resource. We also are thankful that you are providing your slides, which will be available uh, for download to conference attendees as well as information on the tracker. So again, thank you for your time uh, today and sharing this very, very valuable information with us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. We do have a question, I understand. What is the question, Brittany? So I don't know, John, if you can see that question as well, I but can. the question is asking about um, when, if, uh, when a vaccine is introduced, uh, when will that vaccine actually have an impact on the economy? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think there's part of that, which I really don't have any expert knowledge on, uh, but based on what I've read in the New York Times or other newspapers uh, from the news, uh, it's going to be, uh, I'd say kind of until the spring or early summer when production, you know, the vaccine needs to get formally approved and then production needs to ramp up to have enough doses to be not just available for first responders or vulnerable populations, but more generally available. I think that element is particularly important because coming back to what's the underlying problem here, it's that people don't wanna go out and eat in a restaurant. They don't feel safe doing so because they're worried they're going to get sick. And so the fundamental thing that we need to achieve is to get people to be comfortable going back and you know eating in a restaurant that's not just open in a socially distanced way, but that's open in a way like it used to be where they're packing people in on a Friday night and you know, that's where they're really making the revenues. Uh, and so I think part of that is, is getting the vaccine to be widely available and getting uh, case rates down. But part of it is just making people feel comfortable that, uh, that things are safe. And so I think uh, even after the vaccine is widely available, I think that that's gonna take a little bit of time.